Welcome once again to our Thought for the Week for this week for March the 7th. It's lovely to have you with us and uh, we're looking at the book of Habakkuk and uh, I'm wearing my England uh, rugby staff in sympathy with Habakkuk because I'm wearing it with a mixture of faith, anxiety and confusion. And to be honest, I think there's a bit of those three things in Habakkuk as well as he writes. But uh, uh, be that as it may, uh, rugby fans, we hope for a better day. What, one thing about lockdown is that we get to read a bit more. And I wonder what you've been reading. I've enjoyed two books recently written by friends of mine, which has been fun. One, uh, called She's Just Alice by Joanna Whitaker, was a very moving account of a mother's care for a disabled child who eventually died aged five. The mother's, Joanna's, Christian faith shone through as she battled with great and unanswerable questions about suffering. The other very different book, The Magpie Winter by Renara Barclay, is a ghost story told through the eyes of a child. And again, it raises all sorts of questions about suffering and premature death and how the supernatural fits in. It even has a vicar as the hero. I moved on that, moved on from that to the third of Hilary Mantel's trilogy about Thomas Cromwell. This one's called uh, The Mirror and, and the Light. It deals with the a decade that fascinates me more than any other, the 1530s. In many ways, that decade shaped our future, but it contains an appalling catalogue of carnage, death and suffering, as Henry VIII reigns, to be honest, more in the style of Saddam Hussein than Boris Johnson. Even those closest to the king, his queen, Anne Boleyn, and his chief advisor, Cromwell himself, do not escape the block. But I must admit that I probably, like you, had not actually recently read the little book of Habakkuk. But look what happens when we get there. The 7th century BC prophet is battling with the same questions that Hilary Mantel and my two friends were writing about. Is God really good? And if so, what is he doing about the appalling suffering in the world? Habakkuk has been called the father of the philosophy of religion. And as we look at his words over these few weeks, I hope we will reach the same conclusion that he does. But we'll, we'll come to that a little bit later. For now, let's just hear a bit of the book. We're going to read uh, from Habakkuk chapter 1, and Camilla Dawkes is going to read for us today. Then the Lord said to his people, Keep watching the nations round you, and you will be astonished at what you see. I am going to do something that you will not believe when you hear about it. I am bringing the Babylonians to power, those fierce, restless people. They are marching out across the world to conquer other lands. They spread fear and terror, and in their pride they are a law to themselves. Their horses are faster than leopards, fiercer than hungry wolves. Their horsemen come riding from distant lands. Their horses paw the ground. They come swooping down like eagles, attacking their prey. Their armies advance in violent conquest, and everyone is terrified as they approach. Their captives are as numerous as grains of sand. They treat kings with contempt and laugh at high officials. No fortress can stop them. They pile up earth against it and capture it. Then they sweep on like the wind and are gone. These men whose power is their God. Lord, from the very beginning, you are God. You are my God, holy and eternal. Lord, my God and protector, you have chosen the Babylonians and made them strong so that they can punish us. But how can you stand these treacherous evil men? Your eyes are too holy to look at evil and you cannot stand the sight of people doing wrong. So why are you silent while they destroy people who are more righteous than they are? How can you treat people like fish or like a swarm of insects that have no ruler to direct them? The Babylonians catch people with hooks as though they were fish. 
they drag them off in nets and shout for joy over their catch. They even worship their nets and offer sacrifices to them because their nets provide them with the best of everything. Are they going to use their swords forever and keep on destroying nations without mercy? Thank you so much, Camilla, for reading for us. You will recall from last week that Habakkuk is pleading with God to do something about the grave injustices that he sees all around him, the wicked hemming in the righteous, as he puts it. Verses 5 to 11 are what Habakkuk perceives to be God's answer to his question. He sees the imminent attack by the Babylonians, the Chaldeans as they're sometimes called, to be God's judgment on the wickedness of the nation. Now just, just imagine that it read like this. Look around the world and take note. I'm going to do something in your days that you will hardly be able to believe. A global pandemic is going to sweep through the world. It will be the most infectious virus to hit the world for generations. It will wipe out hundreds of thousands of people. It will be indiscriminate, but the most vulnerable will suffer most. It will be feared and dreaded, and just when you think you have it under control, a new variant will emerge, and the efficacy of the newly created vaccines will be called into question. Imagine that. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm very far convinced that this is the way we should see coronavirus. But Habakkuk's message to his contemporaries would have seemed like that, I suggest. Seeing the godlessness of his generation, the wholesale abandonment of the Ten Commandments and the rise of alternative religious activity, Habakkuk was horrified. And like us now, he pleaded with God for revival. He knew that the Babylonians were coming and there was going to be a terrible disaster and many would be taken into captivity. Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, would of course be among them. Utterly convinced, and correctly so, that this was going to happen, Habakkuk believed it to be God's judgment on the people. Lord, you have appointed them to execute judgment, he says in verse 12. His worldview, which Paul explained so well to us last week, is that God is holy and will not tolerate evil. What surprised Habakkuk is not so much that a terrible thing is going to happen as why it has not happened sooner. Why has God not uh, acted sooner to bring disaster upon a society that has turned its back on him? Were he around now, he might be saying something like this. How long, Lord, before Christian values are restored and respected again in our land? How long will God put up with the gross inequalities in our world? How long before there is a reckoning for global poverty or racism or fatherlessness or abortion on demand or terrorism or paedophilia or drug addiction and crime waves? And of course you can, add, you can add whatever appalls you as you look at the world today. Be it damage to the environment or more locally perhaps, malnourished children, even here in Whitney, which Beesham and the Whitney Food Bank are trying to do something about, or starving children in Zimbabwe, which Tom Bennion's wonderful Zane organisation is helping with. So, so what can we learn from this? Some time ago I had dinner with two friends in London. We were talking about our lives as one does. Uh, one was an investment banker who had worked with an Icelandic bank during the crash of 2008. He shared a little of the pressures he had been under, which led to a sort of a breakdown and a change of career. One is a sports journalist who covers England cricket tours abroad. He was describing his weekly essay crisis, as he called it, his column in a national newspaper, which he is entirely responsible for. He has to think what to write about and then to do it. And being a relatively distinguished writer, he can do more or less what he wants, regardless of his editor's preferences. I shared how producing a sermon, more or less weekly, is also a bit like a student's essay crisis. So they asked me how I decided what to preach on. And of course I explained that we had biblical series, we worked through a book, etc. What this week, they asked. Habakkuk, I replied. It so happened, a few years ago, that I was about to preach on this very passage. And to be honest, it was a bit of a conversation stopper. Neither of them had heard of Habakkuk and they were pretty sure he would have very little relevant to say about either the credit crunch or the England cricket tour. How wrong they would have been. Habakkuk has a lot to say about defeat at the hands of entirely mysterious enemies, 
uh, not an, an unknown experience of the Union cricket team right now. And Habakkuk has a lot to say about achieving great wealth in ever so slightly dodgy ways. We'll see that in chapter two next week. Our prophet asks two of the great questions that believers have confronted for hundreds if not thousands of years. Why does God allow the wicked to prosper and the righteous to suffer? And even more perplexing, why does God seem to use the wicked to inflict suffering on the righteous? That's the problem we're trying to solve in the next few weeks with Habakkuk's help. <laughs> Wish us luck. We will look at the historical context and then the prophet's message. So first, let's look at the historical context because it helps us to understand Habakkuk's dilemma. The prophet Micah prophesied, prophesied that Israel, the northern kingdom, remember Habakkuk's in the southern kingdom, would be found guilty of injustice, uh, lack of mercy, idolatry, and that they would be invaded and taken into captivity by the Assyrians. Uh, this had happened by the time of Habakkuk. A succession of pretty useless kings had come and gone in Judah, the southern kingdom, Habakkuk's home, until Josiah's reign, 640 to 608 BC. Josiah restored true worship and righted some of the wrongs in society. But following his death at the Battle of Megiddo in 603 BC, first Jehoahaz and then Jehoiakim, who was a puppet of the Egyptian pharaoh Necho, oversaw a rapid decline an undoing of all Josiah's good reforms. Habakkuk had lived through the raised hopes of Josiah's reign, and he now saw the whole thing coming tumbling down. And he speaks for the people, imploring the Lord for help. He speaks for the godly people. The other minor prophets spoke the word of the Lord to the people. Habakkuk is different. He brings the people's case before the Lord, the, the, the people who are trying to follow the Lord. He looks at his declining society, beset by internal corruption, financial recession, threatened again by external invasion, this time by the Babylonians. And he asks the question we might well be asking right now. What, what the heck is going on? What's happening, Lord? You'll need to tune in for the next few weeks to get the detailed answers. But here are, th are three spoilers. So secondly, uh, Habakkuk's message. What was his message? Three things. Let me, let me quickly take you through the passage so that you can see what's happening. Verses 1 to 4, he sees all the injustices just as Amos, Hosea and Micah in the northern kingdom had in their day and asks God, why doesn't he do something about it? Verses 5 to 11, the Lord answers him. He is about to do something that will not only bring judgment on Judah, but utterly appall Habakkuk, namely raise up the ferocious Babylonians who will come and overrun Judah and even capture Jerusalem. And you can see in the language how shocked Habakkuk is to discover this. In verses 12 to 17, Habakkuk voices his consternation. How can God use such terrible people to bring judgment on Israel? Both good and bad will be hooked up in the Babylonian net. There will be indiscriminate suffering. In some despair, in chapter 2, verse 1, Habakkuk positions himself on the walls, the ramparts of Jerusalem. And he resolves to watch and see what happens in the hope of making sense of it. He hopes to hear from God answering his complaint. Perhaps you could picture yourself in lockdown sitting uh, on, a, on a Cotswold Hill, maybe up on that lovely crossroads uh, between uh, Burford and, and Charlbury, looking north and west across the valley. It's a sensational view. Maybe sitting on uh, what I call Robin Brown's seat above uh, Astle, looking out over what the bridge described as the Astal Flood. And you're watching to see what will happen. And you're thinking. We'll look at chapter 2 next week. Not only does Habakkuk want to understand himself what God is doing, but he wants to have an answer to those who demand answers from him. He's like a vicar in a local church and people are saying, what's going on? I recall many years ago a, a British cyclist, Phil Bateman, coming with such a question to me at the Olympic Games in Korea. He had been injured and his participation in the Games appeared to be over. He had come to the Games just as a travelling reserve, having trained for years and years for this great moment, only to see it snatched away from him. Perhaps rather like some of the Olympians are feeling now, as they don't know whether Japan will happen or not in the summer. Phil had been a Christian for a couple of years. Uh, 
Why has God brought me here to suffer, he asked me, when he came to the religious centre. I don't know, I said. Well, you're supposed to, aren't you, he said. After all, you're the chaplain. And no doubt that was the sort of thing being, being said to Habakkuk. You're the prophet, you're the pastor. Tell us what's going on. What's happening? So I have some sympathy, therefore, with Habakkuk's dilemma. I'm happy to report that, in fact, Phil did get to compete in the Games, but without medal success, but something else wonderful happened. But that, that's another story. What is Habakkuk's answer to these huge questions? He has, as I said earlier, been called the father of the study of the philosophy of religion. So an awful lot of people have written an awful lot of books trying to solve the questions he raises here. But I'm going to summarise with these three points, which I mentioned earlier. Firstly, Habakkuk concludes first, God wins in the end. Look at the wonderful words in, in, chapter, uh, in verse uh, 3 of chapter 2. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and it will not prove false. God's timing and man's timing is not the same. He can see the whole picture, but we see only a snapshot of time. Now my point is not to say who is right or wrong, but to point out, as Habakkuk discovered on the ramparts, that as yet we do not know, but God will work it out, and it will make sense in the end. Perhaps already we can see that. Covid may be seen as a kind of wake-up call for our world, greater concern for one another, more care of the environment, perhaps even increased church going, at least via Zoom. Don't misunderstand him or me. He is not saying for one moment that the Babylonians were good, and I'm not saying that Covid is good. They and it are bad, terrible. But God can bring good out of calamity. That's Habakkuk's message. Secondly, not only is God vindicated in the end, but the wicked get their just reward in the end. In chapter 2, we will hear about the final destruction of the Babylonian invader. And Covid will also be defeated. Habakkuk knows that the God of Israel is a sovereign God. He said that in chapter 1 and verse 12. God is holy and eternal. He says that we will not all die. And we won't all die of Covid. He is entitled to pursue, God is entitled to pursue his purposes any way he chooses to. And thirdly, the faith of the righteous will always be vindicated. In chapter 2 and verse 4, he tells us that the righteous will live by faith. It's one of the verses of the Old Testament which had a big influence on Paul's thinking and led him to explain what we know as the doctrine of justification by faith. And we'll come to it next week. Six centuries before Christ, Habakkuk, agonising over some of the great philosophical issues in religion, glimpsed and hinted at a very important lesson. Whatever happens in life, keep believing in God. Keep trusting him. Hang on to him. And you will have life as he intended. And it will, in the end, make sense. One commentator concludes like this. Habakkuk teaches that the righteous will live and the wicked perish. This is still true, ultimately, if not immediately. It may appear at times as though wickedness has the upper hand or that God is too slow to act, but it must be remembered that his sovereign knowledge and will have predetermined judgment for the wicked and life for the righteous, the righteous who live by faith. These are the unalterable facts of history. It is a lesson each generation needs to learn. From our side of the cross, where the Lord Jesus died, we can see that Habakkuk's desperate plea that God act to rescue society from their sinful ways was answered in the most wonderful way. Far from raising up an invading army or a global pandemic, he came himself in the person of his beloved son and bore the sin of us all on the cross of Calvary. Sometimes I cheat a bit when I'm reading a novel, although I try not to and I read the final page before I get there. So let's do that as I close. Just look at the majestic words in chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. 
my prayer is that we might have that kind of faith as we go through this pandemic and finally emerge from it. The splendor of a king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And dark Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God! Sing with me, how great is our God! And all who sing, how great, how great is our God! And time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God of three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion. Thank you, David, so much for leading us in that song. And now we're going to go over to Kieran, who can lead us in prayers. Kieran did a lovely tribute for Malcolm at his funeral this week, and uh, it's great to have Kieran leading us in prayer uh, now. Prayer for the world. Dear loving Father God, in your son's short time on earth, he sought out the unloved, the marginalized, the outcasts. Keep us today from the dangers of nationalism and xenophobia, from becoming a fortress island as we pass 20 million citizens vaccinated. Help us to look beyond our borders to our brothers and sisters living in fear of this dreadful pandemic, and to pray for them as Jesus would, that they may soon receive the comfort and protection of a vaccination. A prayer for our political leaders. Dear Lord, we ask you to bestow on our government the determination, the perseverance and the intelligence to deal with this crisis in the right way. A crisis no one has any experience of 
or training for. Keep them strong, keep them vigil, keep them honest, and keep them from the dangers of self-importance and recklessness. A prayer for our church leaders. Dear Father God, give our Anglican leaders the wisdom and the clarity to speak powerfully to our nation, to offer your comfort and faith to our little island of 65 million souls, to ensure that a strong Christian message of hope is heard where millions of people are seeking to understand what is happening to them and around them. A prayer for our Swinbrook Church community. Dear Lord, we pray for any of our friends and families who are sick in mind or body as the first anniversary of this crisis arrives. Please show them compassion and comfort. In particular, we pray for the Cookson family, Catherine, Tish and Ollie, who said goodbye to Malcolm recently. Ease their sadness in the certain knowledge that they will be reunited with him in heaven when their own races are run. A prayer for God the good. Dear Father God, help us to understand that all good comes from you and only you. You are incapable of evil. The Babylonians persecuted generations of God's people, but ultimately your judgment fell upon them. Their military might turned to dust. Their capital city was obliterated from the face of the earth, while God's city of Jerusalem still stands. Finally, a prayer for our doubt to turn to absolute faith in you. Dear Father God, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians tells us not to lose heart. Imprint on our souls the wisdom that recognizes the ultimate sacrifice that your Son, our Savior, made by accepting death in the most horrific way on the cross to wipe clean our past, present and future sins. Give us the grace to accept the sadness, pain and disappointment that peppers our lives as merely light and momentary troubles that are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And now, let us end by saying together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Kieran, uh, for your prayers. And we've moved to a different part of the garden now. It's still pretty chilly here, but we've got Ian and Christine Brown uh, with us uh, today, and uh, we're going to do our usual interview at the end of our Thought for the Week. So welcome to you both. It's Thank lovely, you. lovely Thank to you. have you here with us. Now, I know that you've, um, your family are scattered around the world, so um, my first question is really, how have you got through lockdown with them so far away? It must have been, Christine, it must have been pretty grim not seeing them for so long. It has been, um, but thank goodness for technology, for FaceTime and WhatsApp and Zoom, and we can see them as often as we want to through a screen. Just remind me where they are in the so world. So Chloe um, is in California, near San Francisco. Married to Daniel with two boys. Yeah. Um, she's there permanently in California. Stuart uh, is in South Korea, but on an island called Jeju, which is on the south of South Korea. Beautiful island. Right? They're quite safe yeah. there. Married to Joe with three children. What do they do there? Um, he's housemaster in a boarding school, an English school for Korean students. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. And we've been fortunate to visit there, so it's... Well, we do hope that you'll be able to see them anyway, sometime during this year at some stage. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we hope so. <laughs> now, I happen to know that you two, now you've been married for many, many years, right? mm. but you are a teenage romance, I think. Tell us how you we met are. and how you met each other and how you became Christians. Well, uh, I was brought up in a Christian family uh, and went to a Baptist church. Uh, Whereabouts in the country? Uh, in Essex. Oh. Yeah, um, we're both from Essex. Essex you're, girl. You're Essex girl. I'm yeah. proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I was baptised by immersion when I was 17. Uh -huh. uh, and so I was very lucky to be brought up in a, a Christian family, mm -hmm. uh, which really helped my faith. And I used to go along to a youth club and I met That's... this 
Yeah. That's where I met Ian, yeah. at this youth club. <laughs> Any church background for you? No, my parents didn't go to church, but I was uh, sent to Sunday school right. and confirmed. Right. But it didn't really mean that much to me until I met Ian and went along to the Baptist church with Ian. Yeah. Right. And did you hear the gospel then for the sort of first time or yes. heard it clearly? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So do you, have a, do you have a moment when you would say you became a Christian, Christine? Uh, yes, it was um, on profession of faith, really. Um, mm. uh, there was an opportunity for me to be baptised at the Baptist Church, but because I'd been confirmed, I thought that was my step, but I joined the church on profession of faith, mm -hmm. and that was my right. stepping into... Right. Okay. And how old were you when you got married then? You, so you, you, well, yeah, we you, started to go out... Uh, we debate this a little bit, 16 and 17, yeah. uh, and we got married when I was 21 and Christine was 20. All right, okay. Yeah. Been married 50 years. Yeah. Hard to believe. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. So, then, and then professional life, obviously, in due course. Um, yes, yeah, student I, life or professional life, what I, happened? I still remember, um, I started work for a local company, Plessis, uh, but then got an opportunity to join Aramco, the Arabian American Oil Company in Saudi. So uh, I went out there ahead of Christine when I was 24. Mm. I still remember the Baptist minister uh, coming to Heathrow, mm. saying a prayer before I got See on the plane. Right. Amazing. And Christine followed. It was about three months later because we had to get a residence visa for Christine. Mm. And I worked for them for six years. Incredible experience. Right. Probably working on the biggest project there's ever been in, in the world, the Saudi gas program. And, and funnily enough, of course, you were there with great friends of ours, Richard, yes. Richard and Maggie. We Rich. were lovely to reunite you with it, them last year. That was wonderful. That was After amazing. 40 really years good. or something. I know, yeah. it's amazing. <laughs> so just on that, uh, we've always been lucky, not lucky, uh, God's planned that we go to places where there's churches that we can go along, get support, teaching, and Richard... And so you, you were inside, you were living in an in a expat commune, community of some yes. sort, presumably. Yes, but... Where there was a good church. Y yes. Mm. So were the children born in Saudi? No. Huh. No. Do no. you have the children already, or later? No, no, later. They were right. born in England. Okay, mm. right. So yeah. what happened then after Saudi? Back uh, to England, uh, where I worked for Esso for about four years, and Shell, yeah. and then uh, Shell moved me moved us to Holland where we lived for 12 years right. uh, and really before we went to Holland our church life was getting a, a little bit challenging uh, our batteries were running low mm -hmm. and we both firmly believed that was a God move within Shell yeah. uh, to Holland where uh, the church there was incredible right. uh, and there, though, a health crisis came upon you. Was that in Holland? It was in Holland, yes. So tell us a little yes, bit about that, yes. Christine. Um, I discovered I had got breast cancer, which was quite a shock. I was only in my late 40s. Mm. Children were uh, late teens. And, um, but uh, I think, I mean, I'm fine now, 25 years on, I'm mm. fine. But thank, thank the Lord for that. Yeah. The church family really helped mm. And w I was rock bottom, yeah. and so was Ian. Yeah. But we both had support from our church family, so we were just so blessed. When you say rock bottom, in you're, my you're obviously frightened. Would you say your faith was rock bottom at that point yes. too? Yes. Yes. You really found it hard to believe God was there at all. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Why had God done this yeah. to me? Why me? Yeah. Um, but uh, we came through it. Yeah. With the help of the church family. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And how you then had a bit of a drama as well. Yes, yeah. I did. Um, I developed repetitive strain injury, which lots of people think is just muscular. It was too much computer work, but it was definitely a lot of techie stuff going on in my head. Uh, and I suffered nerve damage uh, in my arms. Uh, and I've lost my fine motor skills. So mm -hmm. some people say, how on earth can you play the trumpet? I, it's because I can lock my arms, but carrying heavy suitcases or writing, that's all a bit of a challenge, but I've learned to live with that. Uh, and you, this led to early retirement? It led to retiring at 52, <laughs> but again, I think, no, I said I think, God got me on my knees, mm -hmm. uh, and I then had the opportunity to work with charities uh, and we would not be here 
If... Yeah, well, I wanted to. I want to ask about both those things, yeah. really. I want to ask first of all because you've got this tremendous passion to help those who are really struggling in life, but particularly yeah. with your experience with house building, yeah. Habitat for Humanity, and so on. You've yeah. been all sorts of places in the world. Just. Yeah. Just tell us a little bit about how you got into that and what, what you do. Okay, well, uh, the Asian tsunami happened end of 2004. It shook us all rigid when we saw that. Uh, and I had an opportunity to start uh, team leading volunteers, mainly from the UK, house building. And the amazing thing is, I was adding it up the other day, um, I spent at least 40 weeks on these trips actually building or team leading people building houses. Did you know anything about building houses when you started uh, No, I'm a bit of a DIYer. Oh, yes. Yeah. He's good um, around the houses. Oh, yes. Yeah. Very good. But it's, I've had the pleasure, pleasure, honour, building over 100 houses in 20 countries, yeah. meeting incredible people. Yeah. And I think the thing I learned is that when you do something like that, especially with blokes, it's a great opportunity to talk about things they wouldn't normally talk about. Right, right. So you had an opportunity to share your faith in yes. that situation very yeah. much. And Christian, you went on one or two of these trips? I did, I went on one trip, yes. How's your house building? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> it was tough, but uh, yeah. it was such a memorable yeah, yeah. trip. I I'm mean, sure. it, sure. it, it's just amazing. <laughs> and. In early retirement, you had to decide where to live in England, and yes. you came to Burford. Yes. Any particular reason? There was a charity here that I, we both started to work with, right. uh, yeah. but then the town, Burford, made us very welcome. You've been church warden? Yeah, eight <laughs> years, got very involved with fabric and Warwick Hall. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, because your project management is so much part of your life, really, isn't it? It I mean, is. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. Even now... We, when we have a little thing like organising the um, risk assessment for our open air service, it was you, Ian, who yeah. steps up to get that organised. You love doing that, I think, don't you? I do, yeah. and I did that for the charities yeah. as well. And well, you've got a gift for it, I think, definitely, yeah. definitely. And now you find yourselves at Swinbrook, at, yes. you know, and what do you, what do you, what do you enjoy about our little church? Oh, it's just so welcoming and so friendly. It's we wonderful. love the teaching. Um, <laughs> with no holds barred, yeah. you know, let's fire the arrows. I think, I love the humour yeah. that you all give and that allows, I think, uh, you to be challenging at the same time. Uh, and the fact that we feel very at home here. Mm. We're gonna be back in church at some stage, okay. so we're mm. looking Tremendous. forward to that. So uh, get that trumpet warmed up. All right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. You. Now let me close our time together by just saying a, a prayer. Father, we thank you that we can begin to see that there is um, a chance for us all to meet again uh, in church soon. And so we ask that you would bless us during this time of lockdown. I ask for your blessing, the blessing of Father, Son and Holy Spirit on all who are watching this program, listening to it, wherever they are in the world. May, uh, may they know your love and your joy and your peace and a real sense of your providential hand over our lives. So may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all, wherever you are, and remain with you always. Amen. Mm -hmm.